1.5 is the first of a section that they call uh, Math Lab. So it's supposed to be a little bit more applied and uh, sort of fewer problems. Um, and it's supposed to help you develop your understanding and, and feeling for the different topics. So uh, the idea here is that we're graphing geometric sequences in series. And this is actually surprisingly difficult to do with technology for a couple of different reasons, and I'll show you uh, why. So what they want you to do in the section is to uh, pick, uh, generate your own geometric sequences. You pick your own common ratio and your own starting um, term, T1. And I've got four examples here, and I've picked um, one as the starting term for each of them, just to make life easy. And then I have um, the common ratio. They, they want you to pick a ratio greater than 1, so I've picked 2. So that first example is y equals 2x. Now, when you go to a program like GeoGebra or Desmos or on your graphing calculator, and you type in y equals 2 to the power x, uh, you're going to get a continuous function. And the only values that are actually part of the sequence are the ones that correspond to an x value of 1 or 2 or 3, etc. And so you can see that value right there would be the first term. Um, so that would be uh, 2. And then the second term would be 4. Uh, and so I actually have to back up a second here. The T1 is not 1, it's 2 in this case. Uh, the third term would be 8, and then the fourth term would be 16. And so you know, one of the problems you encounter is that these numbers get big very quickly, and so you don't really get to graph very many of them. Uh, but you can see this is not linear, right? not a linear function at all. Let's take a look at uh, a common ratio less than 1. So I've picked a half. So again, the first term is going to correspond to an x value of 1, and that's going to be right there, a half. The second term is going to correspond to an x value of 2, and that'll be a half times a half, which is a quarter. And then we have uh, an eighth for the third term, and a sixteenth for the fourth term, a thirty-second, uh, a sixty-fourth, uh, a 1 128th, and we certainly get to see a few more terms here, but they rapidly approach 0, and you can't even distinguish it from the horizontal axis after a little bit. And again, that's pretty typical of common ratios that are less than 1, or between 0 and 1. The terms get vanishingly small. They approach 0 quite quickly. And that's going to be uh, an important consideration in the next section. Now, this is the next example where uh, we pick a common ratio that's negative between negative 1 and 0. So I've picked negative a half. Now, this you have great difficulty trying to graph using technology. And the problem is that negative a half raised to an integer is pretty easy to do. So for instance, negative a half raised to the power of 1 is just simply negative a half. And so we have a point right there. Negative a half raised to the power of 2 is positive 1 quarter. So that would be something like right there. And then it flip-flops between being positive and negative. We would next have negative 1 eighth, and then positive 1 sixteenth, and then negative 1 32nd etc. And the terms, again, would approach 0 very quickly, flip-flopping between opposite sides of the x-axis. The reason why you can't really graph this using technology very easily is because, uh, unless it has a special sequence uh, feature, which actually the TI-83 does, and I'll show you in class, um, when the x is a non-integer value, if you recall the relationship between rational exponents and radicals, what you're really doing is taking a root. It could be a square root, or a third root, or a fourth root. Um, if it's an even root, like a square root or a fourth root of a negative, you get a non-real answer. And so you can't graph that. So that's a big problem for using technology. Um, the final example is to pick a value, a common ratio that is less than negative 1. And again, you run into the same difficulties here when the base is negative 
you can't have uh, a rational exponent, um, let's say a half. It's, it's not going to know what to do with that. So we can just uh, create the values ourselves. If we have an x value of 1, negative 2 to the power 1 is simply uh, negative 2. Negative 2 to the power 2. When you square a negative, you get a positive. So it's going to be positive 4. And we're quickly going to run out of y-axis here because the next one would be negative 8 and then positive 16 and then negative 32. These would be getting further and further away from the x-axis and they'd be flip-flopping on either side, negative or positive. Now in a way the more interesting uh, application here is what happens with uh, series or partial series. And I've picked just one to take a look at which sort of leads into 1.6. If you can imagine adding up terms of a geometric series that has a common ratio greater than 1, the terms get very big very quickly. And obviously, the more terms you add up, the bigger the partial sum. And if you try to add up enough terms, you can just get higher and higher values. The more interesting application is when the common ratio is less than 1. So for instance, here, the common ratio is half. And I've started with the first term, t1 of 1. Now, this you can actually, instead of graphing this, I'll, I'll leave it to you um, to graph these in the uh, follow the exercises in the book. But uh, I'm going to give you a slightly different um, representation. Imagine that we are graphing or diagramming the partial sums in this square. And imagine the square has an area of 2. So the first partial sum means the sum of the first one terms. In other words, just the first term, which is 1. So that's going to be half of this square. So we can just cut the square in half. And there's half your square. Now, the second partial sum will be the sum of the first two terms, which means we have 1 plus a half. Well, we've already got the 1, which means the other side is also equal to 1. So half of that just means, well, chop it in half like that. So there's the second partial sum. Now the third partial sum, we're just adding to that a quarter. Well, the area that hasn't been shaded in has a has a, an area of a half. So again, we just take a half of that and that has an area of a quarter. So we're going to add a quarter. And then we're going to add an eighth and then we will add a sixteenth and then we will add a thirty-second and you can see where this is leading um, the partial sums are always going to represent areas that are less than the full area of the square which is two so the partial sums are always going to be less than two because in every case we're just taking half of what's not been shaded in and shading it in the terms themselves are approaching zero. Right? They're getting smaller and smaller, and if we go far enough out, we're going to be getting closer and closer to zero. The partial sum of the terms, as you add more and more and more terms, graphically that just corresponds to filling in more and more of this square. And eventually it's really going to look like the square is completely shaded in and all that's going to be left is a tiny tiny little area in the upper right hand corner and so you can think of the partial sum itself as approaching a value and the value is the area of the square which is 2 so we're going to look at that in uh, 1.6 now as a just a little side note here, one of the things you do in first year calculus is you look at different um, sequences and series, not just arithmetic and geometric. And for this uh, geometric series, the terms approach zero and the partial sums approach two. One of the things you have to test in calculus is when you have a series where the terms approach zero, does the partial sum converge? In other words, does the partial sum also approach some finite number, like two in this example, or does it keep on getting bigger and bigger and bigger? And it's a 
quite a difficult question. I'll give you an example in class of uh, a partial uh, or a series that looks like it should converge, but in fact does not.